Tonight, stories of survival in the U.S. Deep South after several tornadoes tear rural towns apart. Terror in the dead of night. Hey, y'all need help over there! The destruction revealed by daylight. We lost everything, but we got our life. Everything else around them is just gone. And a massive explosion in Pennsylvania. It was the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. The chocolate factory, now a crater. Plus, Canada's new border rules kick in. I'm actually quite shocked to see how the government is celebrating the turning away of vulnerable people. What the new pact means for migrants at Roxham Road and beyond. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo reporting tonight, John Venevalli Rao. Good evening. Rescuers tonight are still sifting through the rubble after a series of deadly tornadoes ripped through Mississippi and Alabama, killing at least 26 people and one mayor declaring his town was gone. Take a look at this drone footage from what's left of the town of Rolling Fork, pulverized by a late night twister that left a path of devastation more than 120 kilometers long. There are heartbreaking scenes, homes and businesses flattened. CTV's Heather Butts is the latest on the catastrophic damage. It's there, big tornado, big wedge! The tornado emergency touching down after dark, almost impossible to see. The morning light revealing the devastation after the powerful storms roared through parts of the deep south. It sounded like a freight train driving over my home. And it happened so quickly, and all we could hear was the house breaking apart. Eldridge Walker is the mayor of Rolling Fork, Mississippi. It took a direct hit, the tornado leveling this town in the central part of the state. Homes reduced to piles of lumber, trees snapped like twigs, and cars tossed like toys throughout neighborhoods. We lost everything, but we got our life. Told the house out, told my truck out. As many as 12 tornadoes were reported, one on the ground for more than an hour, leaving a trail of destruction across Mississippi and into Alabama. In some of these areas, there was no safe spot to go to. As the twister closed in on one community. Oh, man. <sighs> Dear Jesus, please help them. For some, those prayers were answered as people hid in their bathtubs. My mom had to hold the door closed. We was all in there. I kind of felt like the tornado just pushing me. Others suffered great loss with more than two dozen killed. We had to help dead bodies out of the house. So that is very, that is very disturbing. Like actually seeing people losing their lives over a bad weather like this, that is not nothing happy. We're in the, the, the back edge of it. We need to, all right, let's start going. It just hit Rolling Fork, bro. We have to go help people right now. Go, go, go to Rolling Fork, bro. We have to go help people right now. The damage so widespread, even storm chasers abandoned their pursuit to help. We were actually south. We heard that they needed search and rescue, so we headed this way. Mississippi's governor has issued a state of emergency for areas affected by the severe storms. President Biden says federal support is on the way. John. With more severe weather expected to hit parts of the U.S. tomorrow. Heather, thank you. And an urgent rescue operation is underway in Pennsylvania after a massive explosion at a chocolate factory killed at least two people. Several others remain unaccounted for, and as CTV's Tom Walters reports, the small community where it happened is holding out hope more of the missing will be found alive. Firefighters are still combing through the wreckage of a chocolate factory in West Reading, Pennsylvania. A weather camera captured the moment the building was blown apart. I saw smoke and then I saw a bunch of shingles and building materials falling from the sky and then I knew it was an explosion. It was the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. I've got uh, total destruction. It looks like Palmer candies. Total destruction is right. The factory was shattered, and the blast ignited a four-alarm fire. RM Palmer is a 75-year-old company that makes seasonal products for Valentine's, Easter, Halloween, and Christmas. It's not known why it blew up, but neighbors have their own guesses. I think a gas explosion, the way it sounded. Gas did fuel the flames after lines were ruptured in the blast and firefighters worked into the night to cool the site for searchers. Family members were looking for others and neighbors looking for neighbors. All day today, rescue teams with dogs and imaging devices 
We're looking for five people still believed to be missing. I have one trapped under the rubble. Overnight, a woman who worked on the second floor of the factory was pulled from the wreckage alive. Unfortunately, we found that uh, person and they've got a second chance. Yep. And hopefully, fingers crossed, we're going to find more. In a statement today, the R.M. Palmer Company said it is devastated and is focused on supporting its employees. But it's having trouble now just contacting them because phones, email, all its communication systems were lost in the explosion. Hershey chocolate is also based in Pennsylvania. And today, officials of that company issued a statement of their own, saying they are heartbroken for their fellow candy makers. John? And that factory that exploded employed more than 800 people. Thanks, Tom. An investigation into possible human smuggling is underway in South Texas following the tragic deaths of a pair of migrants found on a freight train. 17 migrants in all were discovered yesterday after police received a 911 call that they were suffocating, trapped in both a shipping container and a hopper car near the border with Mexico. The men who died were from Honduras. Several others are in hospital. South of Montreal, migrants attempting to enter Canada at an irregular border crossing now face the prospect of arrest. As of midnight, new rules to turn them away asylum seekers went into effect. They stem from an agreement between Canada and the U.S. announced yesterday during U.S. President Joe Biden's visit to Ottawa. But as CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports, there are fears the political win has a humanitarian price. This unofficial pathway into Canada is quieter today. If you're crossing here, you will be arrested. Yeah. If you want to come to Canada, you have to go to the point of entry over there at the immigration. Overnight, the rules changed at Quebec's Roxham Road as migrants crossing here won't automatically be able to claim asylum in Canada. We were asking for it for years because it had become problematic. President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced an extension to the Safe Third Country Agreement yesterday. Now asylum seekers can be turned back anywhere along the longest border in the world whereas before it was only at official crossings. The new agreement is clearly a move to attempt to deal with political issues, but refugee determination requires a humanitarian lens, not a political one. New York state officials wanted a solution, but don't know what will happen as more migrants are sent back. There is no plan in place. It's hard to put a pl plan in place when um, something is announced on Friday afternoon uh, that uh, Friday at midnight um, they are closing it down. Since 2017, more than 80,000 people have avoided official crossings to make an asylum claim in Canada. Migrant rights advocates worry these changes will only encourage desperate people to find more treacherous routes. We need to get rid of the Safe Third Country Agreement not extend it. It's already forcing so many people to cross into the country uh, and face abuse and death. As part of the deal, Canada will open up a new path for 15,000 people fleeing persecution to come here over the next year, John, a target that lacks ambition for some human rights groups. All right, Kevin, thank you. Search crews in Montreal have recovered a fifth body from the burned out ruins of a heritage building that caught fire just over a week ago. The victim's remains were located in the rubble this afternoon and turned over to a pathologist for identification. The search continues for two other people still considered missing since the fire. The International Airport in St. John's, Newfoundland remains closed tonight after a fire broke out in the terminal building late Friday. Airport authorities say it started in the ceiling on the second floor and the extent of the damage is worse than first thought. More than 30 flights were canceled or delayed, with the terminal slated to reopen late tomorrow afternoon. The cause of the fire is still unknown. A troubling announcement from Vladimir Putin tonight, with word he plans to deploy tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus, which is next to Ukraine. For the first time in decades, Moscow will station such weapons beyond its borders. The Russian president says the move is in response to Britain, providing Ukraine with armor-piercing rounds that contain depleted uranium. The Kremlin is falsely claiming those shells have nuclear components. A massive showdown in Israel as hundreds of thousands took to the streets in another day of mass protests now in their 12th week. 
A sea of people chanted Constitution. They're angry about President Benjamin Netanyahu's controversial plans to overhaul the justice system, limiting the Supreme Court's powers. Police used water cannons and arrested dozens. Critics have accused Netanyahu of breaking the law by ignoring a conflict of interest over his ongoing trial for corruption. And a fierce clash in western France as a protest about a water reservoir turned violent. Activists set police cars on fire and threw projectiles as they approached a construction area. Police used tear gas and a water cannon to repel them. One officer and a protester were critically injured. The protesters oppose an irrigation project that they say favors large farms over the local community. An earthquake study this week has shaken things up in northern Alberta, suggesting a recent record-breaking tremor was not a natural phenomenon, but rather caused by oil and gas activity. And as Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier explains, the authors say their findings should serve as a warning about the potential of more quakes in the future. Holy f Across much of northern Alberta, rooms shook back in November as a series of earthquakes struck. The largest was a provincial record 5.6 magnitude felt by many, including Laura Brandon. I was standing and I actually had to like hold on to the wall because it was like shaking that much. At the time, provincial regulators said initial findings point to natural tectonic activity. But the authors of a recent study out of California's Stanford University found this event was most likely induced by oil operations in the area. Most of the earthquakes that do occur in the province um, are mostly related to oil and gas industry. It says over the last four decades, 100 million cubic meters or 100 billion liters of wastewater has been pumped deep underground from wells in the area and claims that water put pressure on an ancient fault destabilizing it and ultimately causing the quake. This study shows um, that this is another case where you can get earthquakes and significant magnitude earthquakes when you do this type of process. Alberta is planning to reduce future emissions by pumping massive amounts of CO2 into underground rock formations. Researchers of this study say their findings should serve as a warning. The province needs a plan to manage risks of that process also causing large quakes. So this is part of why monitoring um, that's um, very forward thinking needs to be in place is because you need to catch this. Late the same day that study came out, the provincial regulator did a 180, now also blaming the industry. It's also ordered Obsidian Energy, the owner of the wells, to monitor and come up with a plan to reduce man-made quakes in the region. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Edmonton. And in a global show of solidarity for the planet, the lights in many places went out again tonight for 60 minutes. The annual Earth Hour event saw buildings in cities around the world go dark, including the historic Colosseum in Rome, the famous Sydney Opera House, and the usually brilliant Hong Kong skyline. The aim is to raise awareness about climate change and encourage people to reduce their ecological footprint. The first event took place back in 2007. Coming up, the public fight over a private beach development. Wild areas are being developed into uh, private fiefdoms for wealthy people. Nova Scotia's coastline in the crosshairs, plus a processing pioneer passes away. Call it the battle for the beach in Nova Scotia, with some residents there rallying to restore a pristine piece of shoreline after a public outcry over a developer's rock wall. With more on the coastal controversy, here's CTV's Creason Edgkte. A short drive from Lunenburg, Crescent Beach is both picturesque and popular with families. But the sudden construction of this large wall at the end of the beach is making waves. Private cottages are to be built behind it, and some locals are upset. And there's a lot of people who are very concerned about the um, ecological impacts. Lucy Hendrickson grew up here and is worried, not just about the potential impact on the bay, but also to a tidal marsh behind the development. Peter Bars took these images an hour after the tide came in and says the sea is lapping right up against the wall. More and more wild areas are being developed into uh, private fiefdoms for wealthy people. Critics say construction like this is becoming all too common along Nova Scotia's coast. With 
less space each year for the public and animals. I think it's too bad that the law allows this kind of development, but it does. The province passed a Coastal Protection Act four years ago, but it was never enacted into law, leaving the door open for more developments like this. The Halifax landowner has both municipal and provincial approval. He says he fixed an existing seawall that was crumbling, and provincial inspectors have been out multiple times. But the province's regulations mean this wall shouldn't exist past the high water mark, where Crown Land begins. If it does go on to uh, the high water mark, certainly the ha there has to be conversations taking place. Climate change experts have been pushing for stronger rules on coastal developments. As more intense weather systems like Hurricane Fiona are becoming more common and damaging homes. We need land bylaws and we need zoning so that um, continuing to develop the coastline doesn't happen. And for now, some residents feel all they can do is lobby all levels of government to protect pristine locations like this. Chris Nachkate, CTV News, Halifax. We want to note the loss in the tech world of Intel co-founder Gordon Moore, who died at the age of 94. He was the man behind Moore's Law, his famous prediction in 1965 that computer chips would double in capacity every year or so. He also gave billions to charity through the foundation he and his wife created. Moore died at his home in Hawaii on Friday, leaving a legacy of innovation and philanthropy. Still ahead, homeless by the highway. We've had people call us ignorant, uh, useless people. A new reality at roadside rest stops. Ukrainians who fled their homes following Russia's invasion saw Canada as a safe haven. But in the Waterloo region, a volunteer group is sounding the alarm about refugees now choosing to return to their war-torn country because of the housing crunch here. The group says some refugees aren't getting enough support and are struggling to secure both housing and work. People are arriving at the airport or or have been in the government-assisted hotels or shelter for two weeks and they didn't know where else to go. While Ottawa has extended its emergency visa program for those fleeing violence overseas, volunteers say it's not enough to solve the settlement issues faced by newcomers. The effect of Canada's housing crisis is on full display in B.C.'s Fraser Valley, and you don't have to venture far from the main roads to see it. For a growing number of people, highway rest areas have become more than just a temporary stop. CTV's Michelle Bernaro explains. It's not what you'd expect at a provincial rest area. Though overnight camping is banned, there's a makeshift shelter. People living in cars, RVs and trailers, not passing through, but parked at Bradner Rest Area long term. I'm embarrassed to be here. I'm 49 years old. Sonia has been living in a trailer with her husband and now three growing children for a year and a half. Her daughter was only 16 when they ended up without a place to live. I don't want to be here. I feel like an absolute failure. I feel like, you know, the worst mom in the world. She says her husband works full time, but it's not enough to make ends meet. I can't see us being able to ever afford a house, ever. Shardell has been living here about five months with her fiance, who's employed full time. Rent, insurance for vehicles going up, food going up, fuel going up, everything's just going up. We can't afford it anymore. She says with debt growing, they gave up their rental and eventually got a loan for a trailer. I understand the stigma around it, and I never actually thought I would ever be in a position like this in my whole life. We've had people call us ignorant, uh, useless people, and it's sad that they call us that. Brian Young, who's been here two years, says many at the encampment have fallen on hard times. His wife still works but he lost his restaurant job. When I lost my job, we didn't have enough money to pay the rent, so they booted us out. The housing minister says 408 units of supportive and affordable housing have been funded in Abbotsford, though it's not clear when the new units will open. Not everybody that is in an encampment, not everybody that's at a rest stop is uh, dealing with addictions or mental health. It, there is a housing crisis. We are just not building enough housing fast enough to support people. It's a reality these campers understand all too well as they cling to the hope. All we can do is we keep praying. That things will get better. 
Michelle Brunoro, CTV News, Abbotsford. After the break, a new generation of action heroes. How technology is bringing indigenous characters to life. Well, you could say Niagara Falls has a new top dog this weekend. Good boy. His name is Pal, the German Shepherd, and he's been officially named an honorary mayor until Monday. You can see him being deputized by the actual mayor and then donning the chain of office. Pal has plenty of followers on social media, and his celebrity status is being used to help an effort to support a local kidney clinic. Finally for us tonight, there have been plenty of Hollywood blockbusters about superheroes, but often missing in those are indigenous characters. In Alberta, a new experience and exhibit is all about introducing audiences to some sacred defenders protecting the earth while celebrating indigenous culture and science. With more on that, here's CTV's Kevin Fleming. You literally walk into the graphic production in the massive gallery space at Telespark. It's called Sacred Defenders of the Universe and features four superheroes that represent earth, wind, fire, and water. Earl Benali and Justin Jackbear are the co-creators. Benali says the story is an adaptation of what he was taught by his elders when he was young. During the pandemic, you know, when we all got sent home to our rooms to sit and uh, I think a lot of people uh, went creative, uh, canning food, doing things, drawing, painting. I went to the Sacred Defenders of the Universe. <laughs> the two were hoping to see their characters featured in comic books. So when we started to create the series, we were actually crowdfunding to get enough money to create a comic book. And we did that for a couple of years. And before we could make a comic book, it became an immersive comic book where you can actually be a part of this story. Corey Chewy is the Indigenous Engagement Manager at Telespark and thought telling a story with Indigenous characters was an inspiring idea. She worked with the creators to adapt the story for the gallery. I think the next generation need to see the depth of science within the stories, within Indigenous stories, within the land, and the story to reconnect with nature and how can we help you know, rebalance the earth. Benali and Jack Bear couldn't be happier with how the production turned out. You have to really go two, three, four times to really experience the whole thing. It's that incredible. I hope the stories resonate in a way that, you know, reminds us that we're all connected to nature, that we're all a part of this ecosystem, and we all have a responsibility to be aware of the things around us. The show runs at Tell Us Spark until October. Kevin Fleming, CTV News, Calgary. Well, that's it for us tonight. I'm John Benavalli Rao for Sandy and the rest of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Five crucial questions to expose the truth. Who's at risk? What needs to change? When will justice be done? There was actually a plot to kill you. Where's the proof? Why did this happen? Watch W5 Saturdays at 7 on CTV.